This work, Two Halves with Bale Shell, is part of um, two works which I made. The other one is Two Halves with Conch Shell, and it features these forms, which I see as female forms, uh, could also be seen as echoes, one of the other. These works uh, talk about an experience that I had when I had the Moulton Chandon Fellowship in 95 in Avillier in uh, France, in the Champagne district. And at that stage, I was living in a sort of a chateau, a large house, and I had a dream about being on the edge of a beach and having what looked like a water spout coming towards us on the beach. And it moved through, but it was almost like a rectangle and the water was, you know, spinning, but sort of up into the sky, came up towards us. We all sort of moved out of the way and it cut through the sand and it left a sort of a, a, a channel in the sand and also cut through um, the house, the, the bricks of the house and, you know, sort of cut through them. And in the deep channel in the sa sand, I saw um, a large conch and a large baler shell. And at that stage, a friend of mine, Maureen Fury, uh, was going to come and visit me. And she was working in Cambridge at the time. And I said, have you seen um, any conch or baler shells on your you know, travels or research in the museum? And she said, funny you should say that because that very day she had seen one of both. And so she, um, photocopied it and sent it through to me and it was like what I had seen in the dream and then I sort of was investigating um, why both of those shells were so prominent and they were very large too and so I've always sort of associated the, the conch shell as a male shell, um, you know, quite phallic in some ways but also um, as a signal, a signaler to perhaps, you know, sort of perhaps to escape from conflict, perhaps as signaler to, you know, sort of bring people in for feasting, for many things. So it's something for calling out or making people aware. And the, ba the baler shell I've always thought of as a very female shape. And it's used in our country, in northwest Queensland, uh, for carrying ochre. You often find it at inland remote water holes um, around the water hole. So it's been traded and brought down, sometimes from almost New Guinea, uh, the islands of the Torres Strait, uh, the northern coastline of Australia, and brought all the way inland to these water holes. And I have seen those very ancient old baler shells around many water holes, including over in Western Australia, in inland soaks and water holes, um, up in Arnhem Land, and places further down. And so I think that it's a it's very much a carrier of um, something for sustenance, whether it's water, whether it's also for ochre, for painting up for ceremony, um, for scooping. And the baler shell was also cut down in our area and used as a, a covering, an ornamental covering. Uh, it might be an ornamental sort of necklace form here, um, sometimes here in the pubic area. Um, and parts of it were also used for um, placing on the, uh, the woomerers or the spear throwers and sort of, so it would cup the spear so that then you could sort of throw them. And so I think that it's really interesting following all of those things like ochre, um, baler shell, pearl shell, um, pitchery, native tobacco, which are really important resources. Of course, you know, stone axe tools, all of those sorts of things and following the way that they were tracked and traced and traded um, throughout Australia along what were sort of uh, trading routes, you know, people call them song lines. Uh, they then became the droving routes and in many cases then became the arterial roads throughout Australia. In this case, this splitting of the female form, um, I also associated with uh, connections with my um, mother's side of the family, the maternal side of my family which is Aboriginal. And um, often if I'm using a female form, I'm referencing my grandmother or my um, ancestors. And so those works are sort of talking about culture that's embodied within. It's also the cutting within, and this once again, um, the blues is talking about uh, memory, you know, sort of dreams, that thing of water 
being a carrier. It's almost like a, a conduit um, for culture. And in our country in Northwest Queensland, our people, one year people are known as running water people. Uh, there are springs that bubble out of the ground, subterranean water, which is known as dinosaur water. It's very, very ancient. And it comes up in little bubbles that pierce the surface of um, beautiful gorges like Lawn Hill Gorge or Bujumbulla um, in our country, uh, Gregory River, O'Shaughnessy River, etc. And Louis Creek, where I remember seeing um, springs actually bubbling <clears throat> from deep beneath the ground feeding the country. So anything to do with uh, water, the carrying of water, um, the bubbling of springs is something that is um, almost like a cyclical metaphor within my work. And in our country, uh, the old people say that they can tell where you're from, that is Aboriginal people, by feeling your hair. And I've often wondered if it's because in Lawn Hill Gorge and places like that, there's a lot of limestone in the water and whether that coats your hair and it feels different to when you're swimming in fresh water or salt water because whether you're swimming in those places or even if you're sort of in the artesian basin area with that really strong sort of, you know, um, different, you know, sepia coloured water that comes out, your hair and your body and your smell is different. And I think that that's what, a reason why people are very strongly sort of affiliated with salt water, fresh water, or in our case, maybe it's lime water. <laughs>